One more time, if anyone out in Zoom can hear us here at Garden City Hall, can you please confirm? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, good evening, everyone. This is the Garden City Planning and Zoning Commission's meeting uh, for Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. Uh, the record can show that all commissioners are present. That's Commissioner Shepard, Commissioner Brown, Commissioner Montoya, and Commissioner Wild. Uh, staff present this evening also is Jenna Thornborough and Hannah Veal. We'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, any changes to the agenda is a question for staff. None of that's fine. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so we then move on to the consent agenda, which right now contains only uh, the minutes from our December 21st, uh, 2022 meeting. Um, also though, from time to time, we will move public hearing items over to the consent agenda if uh, and only if it meets several conditions um, and, uh, and those conditions get aired out and a couple of questions I will ask. So um, the one um, that uh, we'd like to see if we can place on the consent agenda is item B under public hearings, uh, VAR FY 2023 dash one. Uh, so the questions are as follows uh, to, to help us determine as to whether or not that can be on the consent agenda. So the first one is, is there anyone in the audience who would like to give public testimony on that item? Anyone on Zoom? This for the... Um... It's for item B, the variance FY 2023-1. Okay. Uh, the second question or second uh, grouping of questions is, uh, is the applicant present for that, for that item? Okay. Uh, can you please state your name for the record? Thank you. Um, and have you had the opportunity to review the findings of fact, conclusions of law, and draft decision, including the draft decisions of approval? Before you answer, I'm going to um, also say for the record that we got the late exhibit today, um, which made this application less complex than it was. Um, so we were we are editing our staff is editing the um, draft conditions of approval uh, item number one will be changed to uh, and staff will correct me if I'm wrong uh, wording will say owners instead of the irrigation district and then uh, we also talked about item six or uh, but but that sort of takes care of itself um, so. Now, having say stated that, uh, have you had the opportunity to review the findings of fact, conclusions of law, and draft decision, including draft conditions of approval? Yeah. And do you agree and consent to these documents in the affirmative, including all conditions of approval? We do. Okay. Um, does staff or any member of the commission have any reason that they feel that this item should be heard? Not me. Okay. So we will add that one to our consent agenda. Um, after that, I think we're ready to uh, make a motion on our consent agenda, um, if we have a motion. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Brown. I move approval of the consent agenda now consisting of the December 21st minutes and item number 
uh, Roman numeral 7B, variance FY 2023, uh, number one, uh, with the change that you indicated prior to this being made by the staff and, and deleting uh, the reference to settlers and it'll only met, say owners, which is, is one owner, turns out. Um, and that that's the only change that that change will include that in the move in the motion and so it includes that variance with that change a second so i have a motion and a second all those in favor please say aye aye aye, aye. there are no nays so the consent agenda is approved and you're approved as well thanks for being here this evening so jumping right into the rest of our items on the agenda First up, CUP FY 2022-15, Joe Roundtree is requesting a conditional use permit for the use of a service provider located at 5226 West Chinden Boulevard. It's located in the C-2 General Zoning District. Mr. Roundtree, are you here? Yeah. All right. Have you come up? Um, while you're walking up here, I'll explain uh, how our flow uh, goes for these uh, items. So um, brief introduction by me, and then you've got 15 minutes to do your presentation. Um, and then uh, city staff will follow you with 15 minutes. Um, and then we'll have a public hearing. Um, you will then get a chance to come back up and provide any rebuttal uh, to anything that was presented before that. Um, and then we'll close the public hearing. And then the commission members will discuss and then we'll get to a motion after that. So, yeah, we're ready for you then, sir. And I Oops, excuse me. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. If you wouldn't mind uh, just your name and address for the record when you come up to the mic. <laughs> Bless you. Um, Elizabeth Keckeritz, 601 Bannock. Um, I'm with Gibbons personally representing the applicant. And do I have a, how do I get this going? Will you show me again? <laughs> Share something. Oh. Great, thank you. Good evening, members of the Planning and Zoning Commission. My name is Elizabeth Keckeritz at 601 Bannock. And I'm here tonight on behalf of Joe Roundtree and Decon LLC, which is a service provider business that is leasing this space at 5226 West Chinden Boulevard, um, which is located within the Chinden Business Center, which is what's pictured here. Um, with me tonight is Joe Roundtree, and who's the owner of the business, and then Justin, and I didn't catch his last name. Jones, who's also um, with the business, and they'll be able to answer any questions that I'm unable to do about their business. Um, first, I want to say thank you to Hannah for working with us. There was the original application came in. There were some issues with us. So we've sort of been back and forth on this um, for some time now, but I think we're getting there and we're getting across the finish line, hopefully tonight. We are seeking a conditional use permit um, to operate a service provider business in about, it's about the lease premises are about 1,680 square feet um, within this larger business center. And we're also seeking as part of that conditional use permit, a waiver of the sidewalk requirements. Just by way of background, Decon is a, it's a new business to the Treasure Valley, um, but it's a locally owned and operated hazard cleanup service provider. Um, what they do is they do biohazard, sort of the things that you hope you never have to deal with in your home, they will come in and do that cleanup for you. Um, and there, as I mentioned, they're leasing the space at the Chinden Business Center. And what pri the primary use of the space is just as their office and as storage of the different chemicals and the different products that they use. Um, they don't anticipate um, individuals, customers. This isn't a sort of walk-in business. This is the sort of business that you call, you say, I need you to come out. They come out and everything's done on site away from the business um, location. 
The current zoning, um, the parcel where Dehan is located is zone C2. It's surrounded by C2 and it's further down the street. There's a, just a lot of commercial in this general vicinity. It is also located within the light industrial Bradley technology district on the flume. Here is where you're sort of looking down at it. If you're trying to really picture this location, if you just go right up Glenwood here and hang a left, this is just a couple blocks down from the fairgrounds parcel. It's across the street from the good coffee shop, Dutch Brothers, Dutch Brothers Coffee Shop. Um, and so it's right in that location. Um, it's made up of, you can see on this map, the business center overall is made up of four separate buildings that total over 38,000 square feet of building space. And the lease premises are only about 4.3% of that total amount. This gives you a better sense of where the unit is located. It is, um, this is the end unit. This is looking west down Chinden Boulevard. If you come into the site, um, there's several parking spaces. So there's sort of this storage area where there's a bunch of um, RVs that are all behind the fence. Then you get to the corner of the building. And at the corner of the building, there's about four parking spaces right in front of it. You look across the parking space, parking lot, and then you can see an additional sort of parallel parking there. Followed by that, there's a green grassy area with some trees and then Chinden Boulevard. Um, one of the things that's so appealing about this space to Decon and to other service providers is the back of this building. This building was really made for this sort of business. Um, it's got every building has its own roll up truck door. It's got a back entrance and it really makes the storage and the use of and loading and unloading the van on their way to and from work um, really convenient here. Um, because as I mentioned, they primarily load the van up, they drive to the customer's house, they do their remediation, they come back, they do their cleanup, throw it all away. So for a, in the C2 zone, a service provider does require a conditional use permit. Um, and a service provider is defined, it's the use of a site um, for an employee of a company or person that provides materials or labor to perform a service or job not located on the site. Um, this includes, it actually specifically calls out damage restoration services. Um, so we most definitely do qualify as a service provider. Um, and that's why we are seeking this conditional use permit. Um, most of the other businesses within the Chinden Business Center um, or in the direct vicinity are also service provider businesses. This is not an unusual or different use in this area. Um, directly within the same building and the second building, you have Window World, Window Covering Outlet, Boise Gutter, and then there's Treasure Valley Solutions, which provides alarm systems and camera systems for homes. And those other businesses all likewise operate as service provider businesses. Um, most of them, I believe, have been there for quite some time, so it's unknown if they ever did receive a CUP on it or not, but there is certainly, this is an established type use in this area. There are four criteria in Garden City Code to approve a conditional use permit, and this use meets all of them. First, the use is appropriate to the location, the lot, and the neighborhood, and it is compatible with other uses in the zoning code. Um, that's pretty obvious when most of the surrounding businesses are likewise service providers. It's simply an office space used to facilitate um, the business's work, and there are really similar businesses all up and down the area. There's also in this direct vicinity, there are no residences, there are no schools. Um, there aren't really any of those things that you're really worried about the sort of service provider business coming in and being too close to. Second, the use is supported by public facilities and services. This site has been existing for quite some time. I believe I read somewhere since 1973, which makes it almost 50 years old. Um, it's been used before, it's an infill parcel. It has water, sewer, power. It's within the police, it's within fire. 
it has all the services are available to it. Um, third, the use does not unreasonably diminish either the health, safety, or welfare of the community. This is not a noxious use. There's no noise associated with it. There's very few vehicle trips. Um, chemicals, to the extent that they're used, they are stored on site and they do comply with all of the various Garden City and DEQ sort of regulations on chemical storage. Um, and they'll continue to store them there in compliance with the regulations, but that is all internal storage. There's nothing outside. Um, this also does not diminish the health, safety, and welfare of community because DECON is providing a really necessary um, service to Garden City and to the rest of the Treasure Valley. This is something you hope you never need to call them, but if you do, you're really glad that they're there. And fourth and finally, the use is not in conflict with the comprehensive plan or other adopted plans, policies, or ordinances of the city. Um, this is simply just allowing a business to operate within its lease space adjacent to other similar office uses in the area. It is located in the Bradley Technological District, Technology District, where it is anticipated that there will be more intensive uses, intensive type uses. So moving on from that, we are also, because this is such a small leased parcel within such a much bigger area, we are asking for a sidewalk waiver. Um, if you look here, you see the building, then there's the space and you can see two parallel parking spaces that are adjacent to the, green, to the grassy area. In order to stay out of ITD right of way, um, the sidewalk would have to go in that location and based on the city's calculations, it would be approximately seven feet long. Um, and that just seems, when you look at the overall, the totality of the circumstances and the different um, criteria, that just seems like a really big lift for a really small bit of sidewalk. Looking at this from the overhead, you can see that the entire frontage is approximately 671 feet. And then you can see in red this very small portion, which we had originally calculated at 25 feet, um, but the city determined to be more appropriate to be seven feet, um, that this would just be a really small, tiny stretch of sidewalk floating in the middle of a much larger um, parking lot area. Um, and additionally, this entire block, there is no other sidewalk yet developed. It looks like the corner lot is vacant currently, and it is, um, and there are no buildings located on it. It is ripe for redevelopment, and it's expected that a sidewalk will be placed in there, both on Chinden and on 52nd Street, or is that, yeah, 52nd Street when it develops. This overall building, the overall business park is also ripe for redevelopment where the owner of the business, not the individual lessees come in, they do a big facelift, they do a lot of improvements to the property. And we expect that that would be a really appropriate time to install sidewalk improvements. Looking here, you can really see that whether it's 25 feet or whether it's seven feet, it really is sort of just a sidewalk to nowhere. Um, it would have to be constructed within the two parallel parking lines. Um, and if it's seven feet, it doesn't even take up an entire parallel parking spot. This creates, in our opinion, a very dangerous condition for drivers pulling in. And when you pull in, people are coming in pretty quickly off of Chinden, and if there's no cars parking there, they just kind of pull right through that area as they continue on their way through this business park. Um, if there are, and so it really creates sort of this confusing situation where you pull in, there's seven feet of sidewalk that you're not expecting because there hasn't been sidewalk anywhere else, there's sidewalk, and then there's no sidewalk, and then it's driveway again. It doesn't even go as far as the um, sign that advertises the business park as a whole. 
It also creates a more dangerous situation for a pedestrian who's walking to have these seven foot when they could just stay on the green grassy area the entire distance or walk over to there is a sidewalk fronting the entire building frontage to walk along that entire distance. Um, so it just, we feel like it creates this really confusing, more dangerous situation to have such a small section of sidewalk. Um, one of the options that was also mentioned was doing some sort of painted pathway, but that I, it actually, in this situation, the way cars come whipping in off of Chinden right there is that seems even more dangerous because no one will really know why there is this seven foot stretch of just painted no cars um, pathway area right there. Um, a sidewalk is required for um, any change in use of, which this would be a change in use of the area. But as I mentioned, this just makes a lot more sense when this entire park redevelops or even if there are two or three units redeveloping at the same time. But when you're only looking at 4% or less of the frontage, this just becomes ultimately becomes a really big lift. So ITD has done a plan for Chinden west of this location, and they determined that sidewalks are most appropriate in that location on the south side. Um, currently, there is not, not that I could find, a plan for this area. However, it does appear that ITD, the city, and Compass have recently applied for a grant to engage in planning efforts on this area. It's our position that most likely, since ITD is already recommending a sidewalk on the south side, that they would continue to support that. But in any event, if there are going to be planning efforts done in this area, if there is going to be looking at a big redevelopment of this, especially as the development of the fairgrounds, the redevelopment of the fairgrounds gets moving, that it also just makes a lot of sense until we know more of what's going on in this area before the time, money, and expense is spent on such a short section of sidewalk. We have talked with ITD. Um, and one of the things is they do prefer longer stretches um, to be installed. However, they don't have really strong opinions one way or the other about this particular. Sorry sorry. to interrupt, but you've got about two minutes left on your 15 minutes. I'm just about done. Okay. All right. So the lack of the sidewalk and looking at the different conditions, um, a waiver is appropriate here. It does not constitute a grant of a special privilege. Um, This is a unique circumstance where the seven foot portion um, will create confusion for pedestrian. It doesn't make it a safer location. This really is also treating lessees of really small areas of office space very similarly. The other lessees of this office space who are all service providers going down the row have not been required to do this sort of thing. It's really treating similarly situated people consistently. Um, it does it does create an undue hardship. This is a very small new business. Um, there's no other sidewalks in the vicinity. They're not doing any modifications or improvements. They moved into this site. They don't have to do anything on the interior. They are in there. They are ready to go. Um, this is a very significant improvement on a site that they thought that they were not going to have to do any improvements on. That was the part of the appeal of this site. Um, It does not unreasonably diminish the health, safety, and welfare of the community. We believe that this actually makes it safer to not have it here because it's not this little sidewalk to nowhere. And because it's seven feet, its presence rather than its absence makes it a hard area. Um, A waiver is the only reasonable manner to overcome this hardship to the subject property because it's simply just too small to build any sort of reasonable um, sidewalk on it. And it's the minimum necessary relief to allow this use of the property. Um, They've only leased the interior of this site. It is really the owner should be, when he goes to redevelop, this would be part of that. Um, It's our opinion, this sort of improvement should be done on a property-wide basis and not on a lease space by lease space basis. Um, The property is ripe for development. And at at such time as the owner applies to redevelop or refresh the property, um, we do believe that the entire 671 feet of frontage 
could be cohesively planned at that time. Really briefly, as to the other issues that were raised um, in the letter, in the staff report having to do with fencing, bicycle parking, pedestrian access, and the landscaping, those also need to be part of this bigger cohesive redesign to try to put in a small little bit of pedestrian access or this little snippet of bike parking. It's all, it just doesn't make sense to do it on such a small, when we're only leasing 4% of the whole site. Um, it would make sense even at 15%, but when you're just talking about such small areas, um, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. This is one of those areas where you do have the discretion to waive this sidewalk requirement. Um, and because it's such a short section that really goes nowhere, it's part of this much larger parcel. Um, there isn't currently this co any sort of cohesive plan for redevelopment. Um, it's a significant expense. It will eat into the parking that is currently there. Um, we do believe that granting this sort of waiver is an appropriate use of your discretion. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Any questions for the applicants you. by the commission? Chairman, I have a question. Yeah, Commissioner Montoya. Thank you for the presentation and uh, the information that you provided. I had a question regarding the value of the improvements that you're going to make to the interior of the project. There were none. They painted. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Commissioner Brown. Mr. Chairman, I do have a question and I, I wanna point you at, the, at the, the letter that was dated January 17th so that I have it clear in my mind Then what you are requesting uh, that we do is number one, grant a waiver with regard to in the draft decision they would be a uh, specific requirement 789 having to do with a sidewalk slice pathway and that we delete requirements three with regard to the fencing four the landscaping and six bicycle place spaces is that correct Yes. So what we are requesting first and foremost is that you grant the conditional use permit so that the business can operate in this location. Um, and then after that, that is correct. Um, the fencing, one of the things that was discussed in the report was if they can show that they're not using this fencing, that it's not part of their leased premises, um, we have no problem, we can bring the lease in and show. And unfortunately we got the staff report after we had submitted our presentation or we could have addressed some more of this, but we can show that this is not part of the lease premises, the fencing. Um, the pedestrian pathway, when you actually dig into the code, it says that you need to do that for new development or redevelopment, adding 15,000 square feet or more. Development is actually constructing something new. It doesn't include just a use. So we feel that that is not applicable. To the extent that there is grassy area in front, first landscaping should be done on an overall, um, on the larger scale, on the more cohesive design. But what exists in front of this unit is slightly more than 500 square feet. And the last one was the bicycle parking. Um, based on our review of the code, I don't believe we need to provide any. Of course, that's something that does not take up a lot of space. If that was left as a requirement, I'm sure we can work with the landlord and get some sort of bicycle parking somewhere on this site. Thank you. That's all. Mr. Chair. Uh, yes. Mr. Uh, Wild. You mentioned um, chemical storage, and that would be in accordance with federal or state regula regulations, secondary containment, those kinds of things. Um, my question is more about when the damage, you know, I think the, the service use is surf pro, restoration pro. So there might be mold on wood material that comes back uh, in, a bed, in a pickup bed or something. What is done with that? I can see, you know, the access would go around to the back. Where's the bad stuff go? Where does it go? You know, I'm actually going to, um, with your permission, Chairman, Commissioner Wells, ask uh, Mr. Roundtree sure. to answer that. Sure. 
So anything that is is moldy or that we can take off the site that comes to normal values. So we would uh, we just take it to the transfer station over on Orchard Street. I believe that's the easiest spot for it. But uh, we can also put that uh, in the dumpster. That was one of the things that uh, we started this project is that we actually did the data a dumpster behind our unit so we could dispose of things there. Anything that we would have collected that would not be the criteria of going to the building, we work with uh, the public services directly for proper schools, away batteries, or any sort of biological contaminant, blood, or feces, or things of that nature. We have a special uh, protocol and containers and things of those building, so it's totally separate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, um, real quick, it's probably clear, but just in case um, the fencing you're saying that's there is not part of the lease space well, that it, your applicant is paying for. That is correct. In fact, the only thing, this is where it all got a little bit tricky on definitions and what's what and what actually applies to which requirements is the applicant has only leased the interior 1,640 square feet. They are not responsible for, they have a license. It's just a non-exclusive license to use the parking. It is, they have nothing to do with the fencing. In fact, if they wanna get in around the back, they have to enter a code in um, because the fencing also includes the storage that's behind. They have nothing to do with the water for the landscaping. I mean, these all make it very difficult for the lessee of a small premises to really make these changes. However, when you apply and you receive permission on behalf of the owner to apply, that's where it gets kind of tricky as to who and which of these things applies to what. And that's why we believe that the language of the sidewalk likely requires a waiver, but some of these others may not even apply at all <clears throat> when okay. you just start really parsing the language. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, well, Commissioner Montoya. Thanks. So is this a, like a full service or a gross lease or a triple net lease? It's triple net. So are they sharing the cost of can expenses, so common area management and maintenance expenses? I believe so. Yeah. They are paying, they have their own utility service, right? They have our own uh, electric and gas. The rest of it is it's just part of our rent. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excuse me. Moving on to staff, staff's presentation for this application. Uh, good afternoon, or I guess evening now, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. This is Conditional Use Permit 2022-0015. Uh, the applicant has requested the use of a service provider at the location of 5226 West Chinden Boulevard, um, known as Deacon LLC. It is a remediation company that provides mitigation services um, at the client requested site. For technicality purposes, staff has included an additional address and parcel for the record because the lease space that is which to be occupied is actually split between two parcels on the Ada County Assessor's website. The analysis consists of both 5226 West Chinden Boulevard as well as 5242 West Chinden Boulevard. The analysis is based off of the lease space um, proportionality uh, or proportional to the entire multi-tenant uh, facility, which spans across these two different parcels. Many of the conditions that were drafted in the, con in the um, condition document um, to require different improvements, which have been discussed, and I will further discuss them tonight, uh, reflect that proportionality about 
4.3% to the site. That proportionality is not to the overall site, um, but rather the proportional um, proportionality to the structural concepts or the other leasey spaces. So the leased space is about 1,600 square feet. The structures together is about 38,000 square feet, and the site in all is about 254,000 square feet total. The staff report identifies that the chain link fencing on the property is not compliant with Garden City Code. Garden City Code requires that, or does not allow for chain link fencing, um, chain link fencing with slats or uh, barbed wire, in which case the property has all of the above. Garden City Code 84A3 states that legal non-conforming fences may remain so long as there are no significant improvements to the site or it's specifically conditioned in a conditional use permit. While there are no significant improvements proposed of this application, the Planning and Zoning Commission has repeatedly required that non-conforming fencing uh, be replaced or removed on those non-compliant properties associated with other conditional use permits. Condition number three reflects this requirement in the decision document. <coughs> as far as the bicycle parking goes, uh, the staff report mentions that the applicant needs to provide two bicycle parking spaces. That is also based off of the proportionality of uh, the site. And while there is no new construction being proposed and there are minor improvements, which we found out is just the painting on the interior of the leased space. Um, and the fact that this is a conditional use permit, which insinuates that it is a new and more intense use of the site. Um, it is not technically required of Garden City Code 85D5D1. Um, however, the commission does have the capability to require additional improvements based off of Garden City Code 86B2 on a site-specific uh, basis. Pedestrian access, um, the staff report identifies that the property is not compliant with pedestrian amenities. This includes both the, uh, the sidewalk as well as the intersite pedestrian connectivity. Um, the applicant has submitted a sidewalk waiver request, requesting to not install any portion of the sidewalk that which is required. Staff has provided additional analysis in the staff report and drafted multiple conditions that reflect sidewalk requirements. The deciding body uh, will be required to determine if the entire frontage, so the 671 feet of West Chinden Boulevard, is required to have a sidewalk or just a portion of the frontage, which is proportional to the space that which is leased. So at that 4.3%, which does equal about seven feet in length of sidewalk, um, or none of the frontage is required to have that sidewalk. The deciding body cannot consider the lack of a sidewalk on adjacent properties when making their determination. However, the rule of proportionality can be used in this, for this application, like I mentioned. Um, when there are multiple lease spaces on a site that are intended to be used by multiple tenants, uh, the proportionality rule uh, can be, uh, or a decision can be made on that proportionality rule. Um, condition number seven, eight, and nine are all drafted options. And uh, however, ITD's comment on the 13th, January 13th was submitted. It was not an official comment to the city, rather it was correspondence between the applicant and ITD themselves. But they, ITD had mentioned that um, the sidewalk, should it be installed within the Chinden right-of-way, would need to have a maintenance agreement with ITD between the applicant or the property owner, um, likely the property owner and ITD for the maintenance of that sidewalk as ITD will not um, 
be doing any maintenance on the sidewalk within their right of way. Um, additionally, and as I mentioned before, there is a lack of overall connectivity within the site. Um, there are a few pedestrian-like sidewalks adjacent to every entrance of all these tenant spaces, but there is nothing connecting the different structures. Um, I can even, I just have an aerial for reference, but we have the four different structures and across the common drive, there is no pedestrian or obvious pedestrian crossing. Um, staff did not draft a condition regarding this. So the commission, if they feel the need uh, to have a painted pathway or a more, more of a hardscape identifying pedestrian crossings within the development, um, that would need to be conditioned. It is unknown if the existing landscaping meets Garden City Code 84I landscaping requirements. Um, a big one or a big code requirement is that 5% of the overall site needs to be dedicated to landscaping. So with the site being about 250,000 square feet, um, or I have it written here, exactly 200. Two, 254,390 square feet. The proportionality rule requires about 547 square feet of the site to be landscaped. In the letter that was submitted to staff on January 17th by the applicant addressing the staff report, um, there was a, a quick demonstration um, of just measure, measuring the square footage of the landscaping buffer in front of the leased space next to West Chinden Boulevard. And it, and it looks to satisfy that 547 square feet of landscaping. So as, as such, um, staff believes that condition number four could be removed um, just based off of this recent resubmittal and demonstration that that landscape buffer does exceed the minimum 547 square feet of landscaping. And as a final note, um, it is not up to the Planning and Zoning Commission to state who is responsible for making those improvements that are associated with a conditional use permit. It is, however, required that those improvements do, do be made. So those improvements need to be made, but whether it's up to the applicant or the property owner is more of a civil discussion. It just needs to, uh, those improvements just need to be made. And with that, I stand for questions. Thank you, Hannah. Any questions for staff? Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Yes, Commissioner Shepard. When you were saying that it's not up to us to determine whether it's the owner or the tenant that makes the changes, but just that the changes have to be made. And um, can you can you clarify that a little bit more for me? Like if we grant a condition or we waive it, does that mean it's waived and the owner doesn't have to do it? Like as far as putting in the sidewalk? or it just means the tenant doesn't do it, but the owner still has to. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Starr Shepard. Um, so when I say that, I'll clarify. When a, a conditional use permit comes in, there are certain code required improvements such as the landscaping and the sidewalking that need to be made in order to grant the approval of that conditional use permit. Um, whether or not it's the applicant themselves making those improvements, so the sidewalk or the landscaping or the property owner making those improvements, that needs to be a discussion between the applicant and the property owner. So the applicant could be acting on behalf of the property owner. We have the affidavit um, as part of the a required document um, stating that the property owner knows that the applicant is pursuing this conditional use permit. Um, so we make these conditions within the approval document saying you are approved, granted X, Y, and Z get completed. So X being sidewalks, Z being landscaping. Um, and you, you as the applicant cannot move into the space um, until those improvements are made and they can be proven to the city and then we will issue your certificate of occupancy. That's how the process normally works. Um, but whether or not it's the applicant making those improvements or the property owner, um, it's up to that civil discussion. Does that clarify? Jane, please tell me where the waiver fits in to that. 
Yeah. Um, so the waiver, if we grant a waiver to the sidewalk here tonight, it's a waiver for this particular conditional use permit um, to not have to install that sidewalk. But say in a year, a new conditional use permit comes along, whether it's in this same exact lease space or next door, the waiver is not applicable. They would, that person or that property owner for the different conditional use permit would need to ask for another waiver to not install the sidewalk. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for staff? <clears throat> Chairman, yeah. Commissioner Montoya. Thanks, Hannah. Um, question regarding the sidewalk policy and the application where a, a sidewalk would be exempt. Mm -hmm. So just to confirm that the reason why this wouldn't be exempt is because it is not a permitted, but a conditional use. Is that correct? Um, can you reiterate that? Sure. So just making sure that the reason, because we've already established that this is less than a significant improvement as defined by the code, right? Correct, yes. So then the, the requirement to get to that part of the policy is that the property has most recently been utilized by a legal existing use, must have a certificate of occupancy for current use or demonstrate legal grandfather rights. And there is no change or zoning use or building occupancy. So, um, so this is a change of zoning use. Correct. So this is a change of uh, the zoning use. So I'm I'm picturing it in my brain. You're looking at the sidewalk policy. There's that little chart demonstrating you need to have this or that plus what you just listed. They do not qualify for any of that charted um, phrasing. Uh, rather, if you scroll up into the sidewalk policy, it's more of the undue hardship or um, it's the the site not being able to accommodate a logical sidewalk. Um, those are the two that come to mind. Sure, but if it was permitted, so it says the change of use is to a permitted zoning use and there is no change in building occupancy and there is no significant improvements, then it would be exempt. From Correct, the plan. Okay. yes. No further questions for staff, it looks like. Okay, thank you, Thank Hannah. you. Okay, at this point, we'll open it up for a public hearing. If there's anybody uh, that wants to provide testimony on this application, whether on Zoom or, or here in the room, I think I've got you two gentlemen filled one of these out. So um, you're... Uh, free to provide testimony if you wanted to, but um, but obviously you're the applicants too. I think both of you are. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, um, on Zoom, yeah. Um, so let me, um, let's check on Zoom here real quick. Okay, Don May has his hand raised. So we'll hear from you, Mr. May. Um, if you could uh, state your name, please, for the record. Yeah, thank you very much. This is Don May, 120 East 41st Street. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, well, the uh, in terms of the sidewalk, the only reason the sidewalk doesn't go anywhere and is so small is because the property is so small. And it's really critical the Garden City enforce its sidewalk requirements as part of its long-term goals to make Chinon a, a green corridor, especially so close to that park. However, however, <laughs> these requirements should be dealt with, in my opinion, during the redevelopment of the entire site and not during the lease of a property, an individual property to a new business. Uh, thank you very much. You have a nice night. Okay, thank you for your time, sir. Anybody else on Zoom that wishes to provide testimony for this application? Okay, no other hands have gone up. So, um, Mr. Roundtree or Mr. Shields, if you want to come up, you can or. Or, or very loud. Well, if you if, um, 
So the difference here is this is uh, three minutes, though, and I haven't mentioned that yet. So. Three minutes. Yes. Oh, boy. Well, I don't think I'll take that long. Uh, I'm Joe with Decon. We're a, we're a small business. Whether it comes out of your house or your body, we clean it up. You know, we're just uh, trying to get things rolling here. We've got a limited budget. And uh, we're really excited to find this spot because it's got some great uh, curb appeal and the, the space really met the needs that we were trying to have, which was a, a spot for our warehouse and for our office. And, uh, you know, just any help you guys can, can do for us, we'd sure appreciate it. You know, just limited getting going, slow getting going. So bucks are a little bit tight. You know, I'm on six months with, uh, with no salary. So that hurts a little bit too. So that's uh, anything you can do, we'd appreciate. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mr. Shields, did you want to? Uh, uh, okay, very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, so um, at this point, um, the applicant can come back up and um, provide any rebuttal on anything that's come up since you were last up here. Okay, <laughs> excuse me. Thank you. Um, we just have a couple of comments. In going through the various requirements, um, we actually are in agreement now with Hannah on several things. We would like to have the landscape requirement deleted. Um, and I think she's okay with that now. Um, the pedestrian access and the biking, bicycle parking, both of those based on the code, um, as Hannah said, they're not technically required. They are something that you could condition, but given the very small leased premises that we're looking at right here, I think it's not required by the code that this, these are really easy to say, we'll wait until this entire site redevelops, because this definitely appears to be a site that is going to be looking at redeveloping in the future. Um, additionally, the chain link fencing, um, based on the language um, in the approval um, or the proposed language, this specific lease premises, they are not going to be using any of that chain link fencing. It's additionally um, a really big, I mean, it's very difficult to remove 4% or 3.8% of a fence somewhere on a premises. This is just, it just sort of goes above and beyond um, the sort of thing that would be expected in this sort of a conditional use permit when this fencing has been there. And it can be, according to the code, if there's a significant improvements, it could be required or it could be conditioned in a conditional use permit. And we are asking that it not be conditioned in the conditional use permit. Um, and so that really does just leave the sidewalk. Um, and the sidewalk, um, we agree with Don May and that it just, and with other people, it just makes a lot more sense to look at this holistically. Everyone agrees that Garden City needs more sidewalks, that Chinden needs some upgrading, that it needs some improvements. But to put this one small section of sidewalk right here, or to call it a pathway where you're just striping the ground for seven feet. Um, you do have the discretion when you work through the um, when you work through the code requirements to grant this. You look at is this an undue influence? Is this going to be an excessive burden? Um, are there, you know, you just look at all of these different, um, let me have got them right here. Um, is it granting a special privilege to not require them to do to install this? Is it an undue hardship? Is it going to unreasonably diminish the health, safety, or welfare? Is waiving this the most reasonable, only reasonable manner to overcome an undue hardship? And it really is. Um, in all of these circumstances, you can look at each one of these boxes and say, putting in such a small section of sidewalk just doesn't make sense here. 
And we absolutely understand the bigger picture and the need for sidewalks, but it really is at what time and place is this most appropriate? And right now on this sort of small leased premises, it just isn't. You have the discretion to grant it in this case. And um, for all of these different reasons, we are requesting that you grant it today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any last questions for the applicant? Okay. We will close the public hearing then and move to the discussion amongst uh, the commission and uh, and uh, come to a motion here. Um, so, uh, Commissioner Shepard, any thoughts on this application? I agree with the applicant that it would provide, like it's an extensive burden and would give an undue hardship to the business owner that the applicant would have to put in such a small amount of sidewalk and take off such a small amount of fencing. And um, I would agree with the waiver for the sidewalk and the fencing and the bicycle, bicycle, um, the bicycle spots and most of the pedestrian pathway. Like I would, I would um, be in favor of approving it with their, with their um, conditions. Okay. okay. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Okay, I think that some of you are going to be amazed probably at what I say because normally uh, you've all had to listen to me lecture on sidewalks and fences in the past, especially those that have been on the panel for a while. Uh, but in this case, uh, let's take care of the sidewalk. In my opinion, first of all, I'm very much in favor of granting this conditional use. Uh, with regard to the sidewalk, I, I for all kinds of reasons. Don't get me wrong, I understand. I don't want you to think that I don't appreciate why Hannah broke what she did in there. I don't know if she has a choice, but we do have a choice. And so what I'm saying is, it doesn't make sense to me to put seven foot sidewalk in there or to strike it. And um, someday, hopefully this whole thing will be re redone and then we can get a sidewalk in. Or hopefully that grant will come in uh, that I played a little bit of that. I wrote a, a letter to the Secretary of Transportation supporting that. So hopefully if ITD and, and the city and everybody gets that grant someday, this whole part of Chinon will be redone. But for right now, what we should do is waive that. And that takes care of that issue. The landscaping issue, Hannah already took care of. It's been taken care of. And I'm coming off the issues that I just summarized that were in the letter of the 17th of January. Uh, with regard to the chain link fence, for a whole lot of reasons, uh, I don't see how you can just get a proportional little piece of it and take care of it. I'm convinced that uh, the attorney is correct when she says that that chain link fence around the perimeters and in the, the storage area that's there is not really associated with what these people are leasing. And I don't think, I understand what Hannah is saying, and I don't think that that requirement should apply. And it, it should, I don't think we need to waiver it. I think we should just say it doesn't need to apply in this instance. And that leaves us with the bicycle thing and that, I really, I agree with that for I don't see the nature of their business in that. It appears to me that it's very little likelihood that there'll ever be anybody come rolling up on a bicycle and stop there and go inside and do any kind of business. So what you're gonna have is bicycle parking that's not ever used. And I'm also convinced that doing that since they're leasing the insides of this and they're not changing the exterior of the building. I don't see that as being a requirement for us to put in there. So I would say that we should delete, we should waive seven, eight, and nine. Those are the requirements. We should delete the bicycle requirement and the chain link requirement and the landscaping already is gonna be deleted pursuant to what Hannah said. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Brown. 
Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. Um, Commissioner Montoya. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I agree with uh, both commissioners who have already discussed this. I did think about how you could do the painted pathway perhaps, but I agree with what the applicant has said about how that can create a hazard. I did think that if you were bumping out parking stalls, it's just gonna create more confusion and potentially people running into other things and making it a little bit more confusing. So I don't really have anything else to add of value beyond what uh, the other commissioners have said. I do believe that this is an appropriate use of the site. I'm in favor of the CUP. It seems like it meets all the other requirements to approve the CUP. So I, I'd echo what they have already mentioned. Thank you, Commissioner Montoya. Commissioner Watt. I mean, it's the, uh, it's the same question we wrestle with all the time. We don't make this applicant build a sidewalk. Nobody will build a sidewalk. But, uh, and, and the, the length of the sidewalk um, is, is not an undue hardship. I just I can't find that that short of a sidewalk is an undue hardship. That doesn't mean I don't think it makes no sense to put that short of a sidewalk in. So while I don't think it's an undue hardship, I do think, um, I mean, I think the problem is um, it's the age old problem in Garden City. Here we have, <clears throat> I don't know how many um, units are in that. Somebody, you probably said tonight at some point. But I mean, if let's say this is a three year lease, and let's say um, a year and a half into it, somebody leases the space next door for another three years, and somebody leases the space next door to that for another three years, and the property owner is just like loving this, everybody's just painting the inside. Um, there's the sidewalk never gets built. Right? I mean, that's that's the problem with the baby here. That said, I support the waiver. Um, I'm just <laughs> illustrating why we have the problem in Garden City and waiting. Uh, you know, it's great. The south side of I don't know why the south side is is prioritized for a sidewalk when the north side is closer to the river, closer to um, Lady Bird Park. Um, that would make more sense to prioritize the sidewalk on the other side, but that's that's a compass planning issue, probably an ITD planning issue, and maybe it's just the first plan is to put it on the other side and come to the side where the applicant's space is. So that's a really long way of saying I agree with all of <laughs> Um, I'll just add um, because I really don't have. Anything to add? Uh, because I agree with all the all the other commissioners um, on this one. Um, we have in our great city um, some major deficiencies on this kind of stuff, and it is it is unfortunate that um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, we pass the buck on this stuff. But it doesn't make sense to 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 do the sidewalk and, and some of the other things. I mean, we have plenty of instances where um, where the building being leased is a is a single occupancy building and they've got a parcel and it's and those are all straightforward um, or more straightforward than this. But yeah, this one um, is unique. And and again, I'll just reiterate that um, I agree with all the other commission members. When, but, you, when you look at each one of these individual, like this one, like a waiver totally makes sense. Like, why would we make you build that little section? Yeah. If if this were not 1,600 square feet, but they were taking up three of those units, and now we're giving up on 20 mm -hmm. foot of sidewalk or 25 foot of sidewalk. Now, what's the magic number? I don't know. Yeah. But we always, what, what the problem the commission's faced with is we always have just the one applicant yep. that we just did, right? So anyway, sorry. No, no, you're good. That's And that's 100% correct. And uh, <clears throat> yeah. So um, I think Commissioner Brown outlined um, 
recommendations from a motion standpoint that need to happen and the draft conditions of approval. Um, uh, let's see, what else, what else, what else? I think that was everything that we needed to clean up as we make our motion. So yeah, I think we are ready for a motion. Want me to do that? Mr. Chairman. Yeah, shot. Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, Commissioner Brown, excuse me. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve uh, conditional use, I get it correct. Conditional use, FY 2022, number 15, uh, for Joe Roundtree and requesting a conditional use permit for the use of a service provider at 5226 West Chinden. And in accordance with the findings and facts, conditions of approval with the following changes to those, uh, the specific requirements, number three would be deleted. That has to do with the chain link fencing. Uh, number four would be deleted. That has to do with the landscaping. Number six be deleted. That has to do with two bicycle spaces. And that a waiver be approved for conditions seven, eight, and nine, which are related to the sidewalk and or pathway and or markings. And I'll also with fines of fast condition of approval and there's some other thing. <laughs> Yeah, you're good. I'll second the motion. Okay, so we have our motion in second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And aye. There are no nays. So you're approved. Thanks for your time here tonight and uh, welcome to Garden City. Thanks for choosing our city to do your business. And good luck to you. Well, yep. Yeah. Okay, our last item here tonight is CPA FY 2022-6. City of Garden City will be proposing changes to the Garden City Parking Code. The changes will include changes to Garden City Code 8-4D, 8-3D, and 5-1. Chairman, members of the commission, um, thank you for your patience while I pulled up the presentation and thank you for your time tonight. Um, this is a, a, a public hearing for an item that you've already seen a couple of times through work sessions. Um, so I may go fairly rapidly through some of the slides. Um, uh, the parking has changed in, in Garden City and uh, subsequently there's been some criticisms of, of parking within Garden City, uh, noting that code requires too little parking of redevelopment and the converse, uh, that code requires too much. Um, there's been criticisms of government regulating parking, lack of enforcement, unclear requirements, um, as, as well as uh, the, the standards uh, that are identified, the design standards. There are a number of strategies uh, that the city has looked at uh, that could be employed uh, to address the parking situation within the city. Uh, but tonight, the strategy that we're looking at are regulatory changes that would be citywide um, and are intended to both facilitate uh, redevelopment and growth as well as preserve existing neighborhoods. Um, the process uh, started with a parking strategies review uh, that goes beyond a review of uh, ordinance changes or, or regulations. Um, and then the city conducted a parking perception survey. 
uh, which would resulted in um, the as one of the strategies being reviewed, which is before you tonight, of uh, uh, three different regulatory approaches uh, being presented, really four or three different. So a repeal of the code in its entirety. Um, and then there was what was called the consistent approach where one parking um, uh, standard would be set for all non-residential uses. And then there was also a use by use approach. And those were taken out to the public uh, for their comments. Um, and then those were the public comments were brought back and reviewed with the design review consultants. Um, and there were multiple reviews with the design review. There were work sessions here and the public comments uh, were also addressed. Uh, and that was consolidated into one ordinance that's before you tonight. Uh, this commission has had two uh, work sessions, and here we are tonight at the public hearing with the with the commission uh, for your recommendation. And then the next step, uh, your recommendation will be taken to city council. Um, there has been considerable public comment on this. Uh, the public, uh, there were 184 participants on the public uh, parking perception survey. Um, and then there was an open house, a virtual open house, as well as an in-person open house. And there were 49 responses um, regarding the draft code at that stage, as well as an additional 21 comments. Um, the, the comments really, the, the public perception survey showed that there were really split opinions on uh, regulation and adequacy with throughout the city. Um, however, as the process went on and looking specifically at regulatory um, uh, approaches, there was a very strong support for the repeal um, for those who commented. So 44 of the 49 responses on the questionnaire looking at the two different uh, regulatory approaches um, or the regulatory approaches uh, did support a repeal. And there was no support for um, the use by use uh, standard. Uh, however, with that, there were comments that came back that having just one standard for all uses within the city was really difficult and that it wasn't necessarily fair. Um, and there, there were the parking reductions that were presented in the original uh, proposals. Um, and the public really did a request that uh, there be an increased number of parking reduction and reduced stringency for that criteria. And the, the public did note that a parking benefit district would be a desirable approach as well. Um, so the proposed changes uh, that have culminated through the process um, include uh, clarification um, to all sections of the parking code. Um, dimensional standards have been added um, and the maximum, we'll call it walking distance, uh, has been consistently noted at a quarter of a mile. Um, it should be noted that there were public comments uh, requesting that that be increased to a half a mile, uh, but through work uh, with the design review committee um, and the, the work sessions here with this group, it was decided for a number of reasons that a quarter of mile, a quarter mile would be more appropriate um, looking at the walkability standards that are um, elsewhere reviewed, um, as well as looking what's already in place in Garden City Code. Prohibition of light trespass um, has been added. So uh, that's something that does come up where neighbors don't appreciate parking being designed. So parking goes directly into somebody's bedroom, for example. Um, pedestrian walkway requirements from a parking area to a building entrance um, has have been added. Um, Parking structure design criteria has been added, and that's actually been added since the last work session. So there's a slide that will specifically address uh, that further on. 
Um, additional bicycle standards have been added. Uh, the garage requirement has been amended to be covered parking. Um, and the, the number of uh, parking has been reduced that would be required to be covered. Um, So um, the ADU uh, initial proposal that came through this uh, body um, did include a space for an ADU, uh, an accessory dwelling unit. Um, however, as uh, this has gone through the process, as well as the ADU uh, code, um, it's been noted that there would be no required motor vehicle space specific to an accessory dwelling unit. So that's not in, in the current code that's being proposed tonight. Um, there's been a reduction of required residential parking reduced for two bedroom units to only require one space where current code requires two spaces. Residential guest parking spaces, um, the requirement for the guest spaces have been reduced. Uh, current code requires um, every two units to have a space. Um, and the proposed code before you tonight would require uh, that code to be in place for the first 10 units and then 0.1 space be required for every unit thereafter. Um, and the number of parking for non-residential uses um, is now defined on a use basis, but those uses have been grouped into categories of high, medium, and low and negligible parking needs. Um, and then there are four uses that are further refined, uh, such as bed and breakfast and lodging, um, manufactured home parks, et cetera. Um, bicycle parking requirements have increased. Um, that's slightly different than some of the public comment that you had heard. Um, and I think the there their origination and also which, what came through this um, uh, body on a work session was the idea in reducing the motor vehicle parking to um, augment uh, the, the transportation through bicycle parking and noting that bicycle parking really takes up very little real estate uh, in comparison to that motor vehicle parking. Um, electric charging stall requirements have been added um, calculation criteria have been added. Standards for alternatives to on-site parking has been amended to be equivalent parking adjustment uh, criteria, and there's been quite a bit of criteria added. Um, however, I should note uh, that as this process has gone on, um, it was requested that staff take out um, the equivalent parking adjustments that didn't give a very high percentage. Um, and so if some of the criteria were, you know, you could get a 0.6% reduction. And so those have been eliminated. And so it's uh, the items that provide a much higher um, adjustment. Um, and an allowance for 50% uh, reduction in required parking stalls for existing structures have has been added. And I think that uh, the, the public hearing that we had directly before this one is a great example of individuals trying to reutilize existing buildings and how do you fit, how do you fit those pieces together and how would you require additional parking? Um, loading facilities are no longer mandatory. Um, there are still provisions when somebody does provide uh, loading facilities that uh, there are some criteria, um, but a requirement for all non-residential uses over a certain size to provide loading has been eliminated. Um, and the addition of a parking benefit district, um, enabling criteria and permitting criteria uh, has been proposed. Um, the allowance of a parking facility use in the R3 zoning district via a conditional use permit has been added. Um, and then as already noted, the addition of a parking benefit uh, district criteria, the permitting side um, has been added on. And then there has been criteria that's currently 
more property maintenance related that's been relocated into the property maintenance versus redevelopment code and conflicting sections have been suggested to be repealed. Um, just some, as the commission has reviewed uh, the code in a very, very similar form um, as what's before you tonight, there are just some highlights I'd like to bring forward. Um, the parking dimension table, um, as drafted right now, um, items in black that are adjacent to items in blue. Uh, the blue is Boise's current code proposal and the items in black are where uh, this draft code would be less than uh, the city of Boise's proposed code. Um, the, the numbers come from the design consultants and really their rationale was, um, it's a little hard to see here for the commission because there's the zoom over the top, but uh, this upper portion is the standard stalls um, and the lower portion are the dimensional standards for the compact stalls. Um, but the design committee had really said, we're looking at the minimum you know, so what do we want is the minimum standards. And the reason I really bring this to your attention is because in looking at other codes, I was unable to find any codes that are um, quite the same as what's proposed. And I just want to bring that uh, forward. And I also do want to note that there is an allowance for up to 50% to be compact. Um, uh, another uh, section of the code that's being proposed that I wanted to bring specifically uh, to your attention because it's something that you did not see in the, the draft that came before you last month as a work session is parking structure design standards. Um, and in short, uh, it's um, stating that the design standards need to meet the specific provisions for non-residential development. Um, and that that's on the ground floor needs to appear commercial in nature. Um, and blank, so blank walls will need to be interrupted um, at every 20 feet with a variety of treatments, including fenestration, trellising for landscaping, artwork, um, et cetera. Um, passive security features shall be provided. Um, so that includes um, light wells, uh, so there would be light um, entering into um, the structure itself or light sources, um, video monitoring, et cetera. Um, that provision wouldn't be required for an automated parking system that would not have people entering the structure to park. And so we're seeing a desire now, um, and we, we do have one approval in the city where it's um, the the car is parked by a mechanical arm versus somebody actually driving into the, the um, structure itself. Um, stair and elevator towers um, are to be located to minimize pedestrians crossing internal drive, um, drive aisles. Um, and then the stalls would need to conform with the minimal dimensional standards for motor vehicle stalls. And again, I believe that there's somewhere in the draft saying that, and it may be in the the um, the table with the the dimensions saying that it wouldn't apply again to those mechanical systems. It's, they wouldn't have the same requirements for people entering and maneuvering the car. Um, and then all entrance and exits um, will need to be clearly defined. Um, via architectural treatments, lighting signage, pedestrian entrances need to be adequately covered and um, designed to reduce hazards. Uh, so clear vision triangles, et cetera. Um, at the last work session, uh, the commission, there was some discussion about making sure that the, the code is adequately flexible uh, to deal with um, uh, uses as they come in. And 
uh, table 846, the proposed table 84D6 equivalent parking adjustments, as already noted, uh, does have that reduction for existing structures for up to 50%, as well as um, a 25% reduction in parking for um, a walkable or existing modal, multimodal site that meets certain criteria that really follows with the, the standard walks for um, requirements for walkability, but there's also a, a bicycle uh, connection component to it. And then most of those uh, adjustments within 84D6 equivalent parking uh, really are up to whoever the applicant is uh, to request. Um, and so they can utilize um, features that would increase transit or we'll call it micromobility. It's a word that's being used um, in the transportation world um, or infrastructure thereof, uh, shared parking, public parking, car share, uh, time limits on parking and unbundling of parking. And so an applicant can start finding equivalents uh, to the required number of um, parking if they employ that. And then the other flexibility as noted during that meeting by Commissioner Montoya is 84D6B, 84D6B the either via conditional use permit or plan unit development. And if an applicant can demonstrate that they're deprived of property rights and privileges, they could request an additional reduction in uh, parking. Um, the commission has uh, learned about parking benefit districts, but this is uh, really a slide that's in here for the benefit of the public. Um, a parking benefit district, as proposed in this code, would just be enabling legislation at this point in time uh, to create special parking uh, districts. Uh, within those uh, parking districts, um, there could be different standards adopted uh, relating to uh, parking requirements, um, but it, it would also uh, um, enable uh, for public metered or permit parking. Um, and those funds that would be um, that would be um, realized by the meters or the permits then could be utilized anything in addition to the what would be required for the operations to be put back into that district to start augmenting uh, the ability for that district to function better. So additional meters, for example, additional sidewalks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so with that, uh, that concludes the, the overview of the changes that are before you or proposed before you tonight. Um, this is a public hearing, and so the chairman will open public testimony. Uh, it's requested that those that provide um, testimony state their name and address for the record and limit their testimony to three minutes. And then tonight, the decision before the Planning and Zoning Commission is a recommendation to City Council. Um, some options before you are to approve as drafted, approve as amended uh, tonight, a uh, recommendation of denial. Um, and should the commission go that route, uh, the staff would request that it be clarified um, if, if the commission does recommend denial, if it, they would rather see a repeal, maintain code is, as is, or if there's another option. And then certainly uh, the commission could request to continue for a date certain uh, and ask uh, for additional work or um, information to be provided at a later date. Um, the next steps provided that the recommendation is made tonight um, would include a public hearing in front of the city council on February 13th at 6 p.m. And the city council, should they approve an ordinance, um, may either do one or three readings. If they do three readings, then it would be the, the con next consecutive uh, two meetings would be readings of the ordinance. And with that, I stand for any questions and I thank you for your time. Well, thank, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much, Jenna. Um, I know this is 
obviously been a big project and a lot of people care about parking. So um, thank you for putting together that presentation and doing all the work you've done on this. Um, questions for Jenna. And I don't have any questions. I just want to thank staff for all the work you've done on this. We've had two work sessions on this. We've had a lot of discussion. Mm -hmm. The product that's in front of us for public hearing tonight is, is the product of a lot of thought and effort. So thank you. Uh, Chairman, uh, Commissioner Wild, uh, thank you very much. And likewise, uh, staff would like to thank this commission for the amount of work that the commission's already put into this. Um, and, and Chairman, I did have one one clarification that I forgot to note. Um, the the public comments. There were several public comments that uh, noted concern that the regulations would preclude their existing business from continuing to operate. And I did want to note that any of these requirements would not be retroactive. Um, for the number of parking spaces required. So as long as the business is an existing legal business that's not um, expanding. So the operations as is this, the these new requirements would not um, be retroactive. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Questions, any more questions or comments? Yeah, Commissioner, yeah, yeah Commissioner Montoya. Thank you very much for all this information. Um, I did have a question regarding the EV parking. And so I see that we're requiring the number of EV parking spaces for all multifamily mixed use and non-residential development. And so is the intention of this to apply to only new development or if we see a CUP that it would trigger any new requirements? Um. Chairman Commissioner Montoya, I believe the way it's drafted as is it would be triggered um, with new use. So, and certainly that could be changed, amended tonight. Good question, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Brown. Uh, when we first saw this and uh, it included the, the poll that done out with the comments from out from everybody, I said that uh, this was a problem like a great big linear programming model that had no feasible space left for a solution. And having said that, I want to echo Commissioner Wild. Good job. Chairman, thank you, Commissioner Brown. <laughs> Further questions, Commissioner Shepard? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Hannah and Jenna and Hannah for putting this together because it was a lot of work. And um, I did have a couple of questions um, in the ordinance on page 33 of the ordinance where it talks about the equivalent parking adjustments for affordable housing. Uh, and it says like 125% reduction for a certain amount of um, dedicated space or dedicated units, I think. Um, like, is the 125% and the 150%, is that the over 100% part, is that to like count for guest parking? So, um, Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner Shepard, um, it, it certainly could count for guest parking or it could count for other parking within. So if it's multifamily, um, it could account um, for the non-affordable um, units that are within the housing development. Um, this was a section that uh, was um, uh, quite a bit lower in the initial proposals uh, that in, in the initial drafts as they worked through. And the design review consultants uh, had noted that um, if it's intended to incentivize affordable housing, that it had to be a number that was high enough that could actually affect that if the intent is to um, be an incentive. And these are for like specific programs. So someone would have to like apply and say that they're gonna have this be like an affordable housing development for 15 or more years. Am I reading that right? 
Um, thank you again, Chairman, Commissioner Shepard. Um, there, one of the criteria that would be required is documentation demonstrating a legally binding program. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. So uh, we will move to the public hearing portion, as Jenna said, and just reiterating what she said to um, each individual that wishes to provide testimony will have three minutes. Um, and we there's nobody in the room here um, besides us. So we'll just look at Zoom and there are two hands raised. Let's start with Lyndon and if you could, uh, when you start your testimony, just uh, provide your full name and address, please. And uh, we welcome your input. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Lyndon Nguyen. My address is 455 East Danica Lane. Um, I just wanted to express just a few concerns. Um, one of them is the, uh, and I know this was moved from a different section of the code with regard to uh, requiring current registration. Let me see what page it is on so I can refer everyone to it. Uh, it'd be property maintenance. It looks like page five, um, where vehicles that are inoperable, uh, which includes motor vehicles without current registration. Um, that's kind of a problem because uh, a, I think enforcement would be a problem because there's plenty of, well, at least one Supreme Court uh, constitutional issue with regard to how do you determine whether or not the vehicle is registered without a police officer going on the property, uh, which is private property. And so um, that's one issue. And the other issue that I see is also there's exceptions with regard to classic vehicles and antique vehicles that do run, but they don't need a current registration. They can be driven as necessary in order to maintain the vehicle. And so I, I don't know how that can be enforced um, without violating constitutional rights. Um, the other issue that I have is, uh, I think the abandoned vehicle ordinance right now, at least the way it's enforced by the police department is, does not comply with um, state law because recently they tried to enforce abandoned vehicles supposedly um, with a bunch of law abiding and tax paying residents. And um, the code allows you to call up the police and say, hey, it's not abandoned. I can't move it right now. Um, and so uh, can you give me a couple, give me an exception or something? Well, the Garden City Police Department said, yeah, no. Um, but the code does allow it. It's code section 49-102, uh, abandoned vehicle, uh, except that a vehicle shall not be considered abandoned if its owner is unable to move it um, and has notified law enforcement. So that should probably be added, I would think, so the police department doesn't use it to harass residents. And you've got about 30 seconds left. Oh, okay. Um, I have, and then concerns with regard to uh, reduction of the uh, parking spaces. Um, I do like the parking benefit, but a residential zone parking would be awesome. And then um, the issue with reducing it is when you have one bedroom or two bedroom homes, you have a husband and wife, two vehicle households, and then how do you park? And so um, there's already a problem with parking, but when you reduce it even more, where are you supposed to put it? And there seems to be a conflict too. If you're requiring vehicles that are not registered or you're working on or whatever to be in a covered parking, but you're reducing covered parking, like now what do you do? You've just made it more difficult for everybody, except for the developers, I guess. Okay. Thank you very much for your comments and for taking the time to prepare them and deliver them tonight. Um, we'll move on to uh, uh, Don May. So uh, I know you provided your name and address for the record earlier, but if you can do that again, uh, sure. we'd appreciate it. Sure, Don May, 120 East 41st Street. Uh, Thank so you. 
Thank you. Uh, Jenna and Hannah have done an absolutely wonderful job with a very technically challenging topic. And all of these proposed changes that I've read through in great detail are wonderful. And instead of focusing on how much I strongly support nearly all of the proposed changes, including the allowance of tandem parking for single tenant residential structures, I'm gonna focus on some additional recommendations. Um, parking spot sizes that they just uh, reviewed there. I believe the standard should be nine by 18. Tons of cities across the US have this standard, including Miami, Florida. Um, the average car length is 14.7 feet. And re with respect to guest residential parking, I, re I believe it should be one half space for every 10 units right away. With respect to the number of residential spaces, I believe you should have one space allowed for up to three bedroom units. Um, with respect to compact parking, I'm hoping you can please add the word required in front of compact parking. Uh, that way, if people wish to provide extra parking above and beyond what's required, they could make it compact if they wish. Um, I believe with respect to covered parking in private garages, uh, it would be great if it's possible for co covered bike parking to be accomplished via private garages. Uh, in this way, people could store their bikes inside their garage where it's safe without having an exterior storage unit. With respect to um, bicycle distance to, to building entrances, ah, this is a big one. Um, the, the distance right now is 50 feet, and that's really way too short and severely constrains the design of multi-purpose sites such as those with townhomes with multiple buildings and large acreages in multiple cities, especially when bikes are most efficiently clustered together. Um, if parking can be allowed within a quarter mile, a quarter mile of a front door, then certainly bikes should be allowed within 500 feet. Um, and then the last thing is with e-bike e parking and e-scooter parking, I believe that e-bike parking and e-scooter parking spots and charging stations should be equivalent to one bike parking spot. That's all, thank you so much. And again, wonderful job by everybody there creating these changes, just incredible. Thank you again. And thank you for your time as well and, and your uh, comments. Um, okay, doesn't look like there's any more out there that wish to provide testimony, um, but I'm just gonna kind of stare at the screen here to make sure nobody else jumps in here for a second and we're probably good. Okay. Um, so not sure, Jenna, if you wanted to provide any more um, info as part of the rebuttal section. Um, uh, Chairman, if I may, I took notes on the laptop. May I? You may. I? <laughs> yes. Um, from here. Um, uh, thank you. And thank you for the accommodation. Um, and I'm looking at the notes that I took from uh, both of the, the the individuals that provided a testimony and their their great suggestions. Um, however, <laughs> with that, it, it's hard on on a site to provide a response um, back um, on any of the items that they brought up. Um, Um, certainly, uh, should uh, the commission direct that uh, the items that were brought up, some or all, all or, or um, certainly uh, staff can in, uh, it, <clears throat> make sure that it gets into the document. Um, and there are two items, or there are two uh, ways that you could address that. I, you could continue this item until next month uh, to make sure that staff adequately address that or just direct uh, which needs to um, be in there and then make um, a recommendation with those noted as needed to needing to be added. Okay. And with that, I, I stand for any additional questions that you okay. might have. Thank you, Jenna. Any Thank other you. questions for staff? Uh, Commissioner yeah. Brown? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, I have a prompt about this very thing. Um, it appears to me, uh, Jenna, I think what you're saying is that we 
we'd be asking you too much at this point that before you had a chance to evaluate what was saying to say whether we should include it or not. And at the same time, I, for my own part, and then I'm probably tending over into what we should be doing when we're discussing it, but this is sort of a special situation. Seems to me that we're gonna to have to give Jenna an opportunity to look into these. For example, I'll give you an example of one of them, Mr. Day, the thing about bikes, vice the 50 feet, that sounds to me to be a good suggestion. Now, whether it's not, it's 500 feet, I don't know if that's right, but I think that Jenna and Hannah should have an opportunity and if necessary, get a hold of, of the design review consultant. I think you can do that under our processes and see what they have to say. And I think that that should also apply with regard to the suggestion about the parking sizes. Before we change what Jenna already explained why the measurements differed from what Boise City was doing and what others did. And that was on the basis, if I recall, as Jenna said, it because that was a recommendation from the design consultant. Well, I think we're gonna need to give Jenna an opportunity to consult with them rather than just, I don't see that we can say, well, yeah, we're gonna adopt all of these. So it's been evaluated and I, on the other hand, I don't think that we should uh, reject them out of hand. At least one of them, uh, the thing about the distance on bikes. Mr. Uh, Chair, yeah. I, 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 I agree with Kent in principle, especially on the 50 foot rule. I think I can imagine applications where we don't necessarily want to cluster bikes 50 feet from the entrance. We want to have a larger bike barn maybe that's secure that is 200 feet right. from the entrance, um, especially for a larger project, I think that makes more sense. Um, however, I think we can accomplish what you want and honor the testimony we've heard tonight um, by advancing this to the city council with a recommendation and then Oh, uh, you know, give Lyndon and Don an opportunity to come back and present their testimony, or at least it'll be part of the record that goes to the city council, which will still give uh, staff time to address those issues in a staff presentation to the city council. So I'd like to keep it moving, I guess. And and uh, so you're thinking, but go ahead, but some kind of language that says that we're recommending approval, but conditioned on the fact that the staff would do some evaluation of what was said here. I don't even think we have to condition it because they're going to do it anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, it's sure, I agree with that because I, I, I think we do want to move it on. We, yeah. we spent a lot of time on this. Okay, well, that wasn't exactly a question, Jeff. <laughs> So I think at this point, I will close the public hearing and we'll just continue on with our discussion. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to add to your comments? Or well, I already good? said, I think they did a great job. <clears throat> I, I think given, given what that, this additional information, I don't have certainly enough information if it's gonna be bad. And my, my thoughts on it are that, yes, we should recommend forwarding it like it is with that little caveat some way. Okay, Commissioner Wild, any further comments? Just that, I agree. I mean, I, I think even if we identify some soft spots that we maybe want a little more robust discussion, we're really just recommending mm -hmm. this right. package to the city council, they can amend it. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Commissioner Montoya. So are we talking about concerns within the proposed ordinance or just a procedural matter of moving forward? Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm fine with the concept of moving forward, but I do have concerns with the EV standards. Specifically, if you're going to be applying those to any change of use, I can just see that as you kind of made a comment of just being another waiver. I mean, it, that, that's a considerable cost to an applicant to provide EV spots or even to do a retrofit for EV, especially if you're talking about bringing services to a parking lot and so forth. 
so I would consider potentially changing something. I don't, I'm not resolved on what the change is, but something maybe where it's significant or substantial versus just minor, and then have it, you know, being something maybe towards a different component of the development so that you're not necessarily just tying it to interior component or something. Um, and then just questioning really um, the EV ready parking space and the intent there. It almost feels like it's, it's a, an attempt, but it's kind of half hearted because if you're just, if you're attempting to have a service that goes out there, you're spending a lot of money to run a service out there and if you're not going to do it, you're just going to have utilities going in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just, I don't know about that. And then just the, if it's, if you have one stall, you're going to have the requirement to have one parking ready space, which just doesn't mean up to me because we've seen so many of these applications have requests for reduced parking. So now are you going to have to have a separate parking stall that's just for EV that no one can use because there's no parking anyways. So it just seems like maybe expand that to if you have more than five stalls, have one that's dedicated or something to it. So you can at least have other people that aren't blocking and you can from the narrowest part of it. Good. Very good. Anything else, Commissioner Montoya? No, thank okay. you. Commissioner Shepard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I came into this parking discussion not really knowing anything about parking, and I wanted to. Um, really express my gratitude to the public for sending us so many um, comments that really helped to educate me um, and also just help me understand what different people think about something I never really thought about much before. And um, I'll be honest, I experienced a complete turnaround. At first, I was very like resistant at the thought of like eliminating parking requirements. But now I'm convinced that it's the best thing to protect housing affordability. And um, I'd like to see the market and individual developers have more control over this. And because of the housing crisis, I think that we need to prioritize homes for people and not for cars. And um, so I'd like to see the minimum parking rules be eliminated and determined by the market. Um, I don't know how that looks as far as like this ordinance that's been drafted because I know that there's the adjustments for affordable housing, the equivalent of parking adjustments. So if there's something that can be done just to make it so that there's not always, parking isn't always required, at least for residential. I haven't quite gotten my mind around um, non-residential right now. I know that there's we're still in a very car-centric society and people need to be able to get to businesses to be able to um, you know, be customers at those businesses. But I, I'd like to see um, us prioritize affordable housing in any place possible. Okay. Those, okay. Are, those are my thoughts. And again, just really appreciate the public's input here. Thank you, Commissioner Shepard. Um, so I'll reiterate again to um, how um, extensive the work is that staff Jenna and Hannah have done on this. It's impressive and obviously um, has taken a ton of time. And um, so I wanted to say that again. Um, I've talked a lot about, I think, in our work sessions, especially the last one, sort of reiterating what Commissioner Shepard just said. Um, I think all the nuts and bolts in the proposed code is great with, especially with some of the edits that um, Commissioner Brown and Commissioner Montoya um, have brought up. I think those were great ideas. And um, uh, the people that uh, Mr. May and Lyndon, their comments as well. So I'm glad that um, uh, the commissioners, the commission has captured uh, some of what they said, and we'll be uh, um, applying some of that, or at least uh, the package that goes to city council will have that on the record. Um, the only thing is, is again, kind of going back to what I said at our last work session is that um, I think, I think the package is fantastic. I just, I just, I think parking, requiring parking in private developments requires uh, minimum parking requirements is just something that is not 
uh, good land use. And it's, it's, a, it's, for whatever reason, it's a big deal to me. So that's, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say that again without uh, going on another 15 minute thing like I did last time. So um, uh, that would be the only thing um, in the package that I would um, want uh, taken out, but it's a big thing. So that probably means that um, my recommendation would be for either a huge amendment that that doesn't that that comes out or just um, that we uh, um, I guess that would be it. I would recommend that it's amended that minimum parking requirements do not exist in the package. Commissioner Brown. Uh, I wasn't going to do this, but that sense that you have done that and also it slows down a lot about Commissioner Shepard. <clears throat> I want to. I think I need to, in fact, I know I'm going to counter that a little bit. And I'm going to counter it with a little bit of economics theory. Okay. And what you say with regard to private developments, letting the, that both of your arguments are let the marketplace decide. And if they were in isolation, the, these developments, and you, and you had that side and it didn't have roads with public right of way and stuff around them, then that would work. But the place where I don't think it can work is because while the parking on that development is a, what's known as a private good, all right? And theoretically, if there's everybody has knowledge about it, then the cost of doing that is internalized to and you you make it up. If the developer decides he's not going to have us so much parking, then that limits what he's doing and he's doing like that. But the problem with it is right next door, door to it in the streets that are around it, there the parking is not a private good. It's a public good and it's free. So what happens is you get an externality that's involved in it. When this certain developer decides I'm gonna make more places without minimum parking, he is not resulting in the people, some of the people that come and buy those needing parking. All he's doing is, is forcing those, those cars, they're going onto the public side. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm where the price right now in Garden City it says we, we, we don't have a benefit district anywhere in the city right now. But there, there you're putting a price. That's why you have a, for a public good like power, and that's why you have a public the PUC, why that exists, because it controls the fact that you're providing public goods so that everybody has to pay a little bit for that. But under this, if you do that and you deregulate private development, you're making a very complex problem with regard to the fact that you'd have this externality that people will be putting their cars on the public space that's next door to all developments because it's got public roads around all of it. Most of them are allowed parking and it's free. So that's why I think, I understand theoretically what you're thinking that, but that's why I don't think it will work. Yeah, and and I actually agree with almost everything you said. Um, because the only thing that I would uh, add is that we would, we would definitely have to uh, employ some benefit districts. I mean, that's got to be part of that as well. Yeah. Um, because you're right. Um, that would just have to be uh, in concert with, with uh, eliminating minimum parking requirements. I just don't think um, 200 square feet or whatever of mandated parking is, is good land use. I mean, 
there's a lot of people in Garden City that that uh, especially that live close to the river. They don't they don't there's two there's they're using their garages to store stuff. So why I mean, and, and if you were to eliminate minimum parking requirements, it doesn't mean no garages will ever be built again. It just means that the developer is going to decide if I'm going to try and sell these 10 units, I think I can sell them without parking or one parking place or two or whatever, but if they're deciding, and if they think they can sell 10 units without any parking, I mean, who, who is the municipality to say, well, no, especially to your point, if, if, if parking is a fee-based thing on the roadway. So I just, philosophically, I just, I just think it's, it's, it's mandating a certain number of parking is, is bad land use, especially in an infill city like ours with the amenities that we do have, um, the infrastructure along the river, the green belt, um, and then what we want to see happen to our city down um, down close to downtown Boise, uh, more more housing, more more density. We can do that with less parking requirements, less parking required. Right is what I'm saying. So anyway, any other comments on this? Okay. Mr. Chairman, I also yep. want to um, follow up on what Commissioner Brown just said, and um, <clears throat> I also agreed, or I didn't expressly state it, but when I um, advocated for eliminating parking minimums, it was under the intention that there would be parking benefit districts in, in place, um, because I do think, like, that was one of my, like, reasons why I was resistant, because I was like, oh, it's just going to all spill out onto the street, and it's going to be really hard to park anywhere, and um, I think it's still, I, I do think that developers are still going to develop places for people's cars in places that people are going to, like, can afford that, you know, like, they're going to be pricing their development higher in I, I, I think that this is going to mostly be for people that are developing for affordable housing that are going to want less parking than more because you know, people still drive, you know. <laughs> so I I just wanted to, to just follow up with that. So that's all. Thank you. Okay. So um, I think we're good here. Um, any comments? Any more? I just okay. Um, I think we're ready for a motion for our recommendation to city council. Mr. Chair. Commissioner Wild. I move, uh, well, before I make a motion, I'll just respectfully request that these issues get addressed when it goes up to the city council. I'm not gonna make it part of the motion. Um, you've heard a lot of comments and <laughs> they'll get to the city council. Uh, I'll move approval of CPA CPA FY 2022-06 uh, amendment to the parking ordinance for Garden City as drafted and presented this evening. I'll second the motion. So, so we have a motion and second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any nays? I would like to ask for clarification, Mr. Chairman. So we're we're moving this up with everything that we've discussed today. So part of the record, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Aye. And I will say nay, um, only because it's a tiny part of the code, but I think it's the biggest part of the code. <laughs> um, so, um, so we have four eyes and one nay. Can I ask another clarification? Forgive me, because I'm kind of new at this, but when we when we talk about moving it forward with everything that we've talked about today, your nay is because you still want there to be parking minimums eliminated, mm -hmm. correct? Because that's what I'm actually wanting to vote for, but I thought with my I vote that that was moving. And either way is fine, I, I think, and I don't want to... Um, I mean, your comments are on the record, and that's the most important part. So if you like 
I mean, I, I guess I would just say that um, your comments are on the record. They'll be there in front of city council. Um, you know, if you felt strongly about it, I mean, you could, I guess, change your vote. Um, but no. Mr. Chairman, I would like to change my vote tonight okay. and also express appreciation for like helping me understand the process. Okay. Thank you. All right. So it's three to two then. So the eyes have it. Um, and I believe we're done here. Any, actually, I should ask any other items outside of everything on here that we need to talk about tonight, either from staff or commission. Okay. We're adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Good, Good job.